been ready for a while now. Um, if you tell me the title before we start, I can get things going. So, what is the title of this episode? You just told me. Don't act like a dummy. Did you use that? Yeah. Why Chad thinks so highly of himself. I would like to know the answer well, to that, too. If, if, if y'all don't know why I think so highly of myself, you YouTube, mm -mm. Uh, obviously you hadn't been watching what I'm all about. If you were like me, you would think highly of yourself, too. But you ain't, son. <laughs> don't laugh. Don't laugh, Chad. <laughs> Oh, well, man, I knew the answer it's, to that. it's good to be back. It's good to be back. Oh, it's been quite a while since we've had the crew together here live on YouTube. I know, guys, if you're watching live, um, sometimes, and actually coming up in the next few weeks, we have multiple interviews scheduled. So if we do an interview, we try to do the interview live on YouTube, but that means that we're not going to, do a podcast on Wednesday. If I record an interview live on YouTube on a Monday with a guest, that's your live for the week. And then the audio version always comes out on the audio platforms on Wednesdays. So we're, we're live once a week. It just might be, sometimes we might be live twice a week and skip a week. But hey, nonetheless, the heck, man? nonetheless, we're just back. Said. Thank you for being here, man. What's up, YouTube? Got beautiful biscuit in the house. How you doing, Bisc? Good morning. You got a segment you want to run before we kick this conversation off, right? Yeah, I have a lot of stuff today. Okay, we got Chili. We got Tech Guy back behind the computer where he belongs. Yeah, nothing got messed up today for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It went pretty... Two episodes. Went pretty smooth. <laughs> um, so, what's your segment, baby? Okay, I'm going to read off all of our first vehicles. And as usual, at the end of the podcast, the last thing we'll do is reveal who drove what car as their first vehicle. Don't let us forget to do that. I don't, I won't forget. Okay. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Vehicle number one, 2006 Red Pontiac Point. So YouTube has to guess who's first whose vehicle that was it yes this is all our first vehicle okay we, we we drove yeah okay um second okay what so year was that pontiac 2006 red pontiac point okay i don't even know what a pontiac point looks shut like. up you're literally giving away the contest right now can you not oh crap i forgot yeah can you thank you um are you not? Do you understand to not say anything? Yeah, else I past do. This I, point? I get it now. Okay, I get it. Um, vehicle number two, a '92 blue Ford F250. Vehicle number three, a '97 gold Ford Ranger. Vehicle number four is a 1979 brown F250. So we got a point, a Pontiac Point, a Ford F250, Ford Ranger. And a 1979 Ford F250. There's a lot of Fords in that lineup. There is. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, we'll see. YouTube, put your guesses in. You might win a prize at the end of this if you guess right. Um, might have Chili send y'all out a new truck talk sticker. Now, you guys, uh, welcome back. This is the premiere ultra running podcast on the web uh it's the premier motivational podcast on the web if you haven't turned in -uh. to uh if you haven't tuned in to this podcast before i'm just letting you know what you're listening to is the best possible podcast that can will ever exist so you should be really thankful to be here uh the reason that you're able to be here it, you have two reasons. One is because of our Patreon supporters. They actually make all of this possible. As a matter of fact, we are about to have to build a new podcast studio because we are growing here at 3 of 7 Project, and we are going to build a new podcast studio. It's going to be better than this one. And we can only do that because of our Patreon supporters and because of our partners, 
here at 307 Project. One of those partners is Hoist. If you guys haven't heard us talk about Hoist, here it is right here, son. We've been using Hoist for over a year around this joint. We put this stuff through the paces, boy. I drank this stuff for five days doing the Coca Dona 250-mile race, which I'm ashamed that it took me five days to finish it. But by gosh, I drank Hoist for five days. And and it and it uh it never messed my stomach up, never got tired of drinking it, and I never had no cramps or dehydration or any of that bull crap that all of you weak people have because I was drinking this stuff like a sieve, son. Let me tell you what, <laughs> Hoist is a great product, but it's also great people. This is made in America, right here in the good old USA. That means a lot to me. It's battlefield tested, warfighter approved. This stuff, it goes out and is being used by the U.S. military in all different environments and being used by us in environments that are harder than any environment that the U.S. military has to have. Um, 70 calories, calcium, potassium, magnesium. It tastes daggone good. Get you some hoist. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. If you're fat and lazy, Get out and start PTing so you can get unfat and lazy and drink hoist while you're doing it so you don't get to be cramping up mm. and, and you don't and you don't quit trying mm. to get unfat and lazy. Tell them. All right. It's easy. Drinkhoist.com. Fat get you turns. some, boy. Drink hoist. Drink this stuff like a sieve. Yeah. <laughs> drink this stuff like a sieve, boy. Hey, look. Brian K, he been on here commenting a lot on the stuff. He just said I'm fixing to get rich this year. I'm donating a crap ton of money to these jokers when I do. Need to spread this team's message. Great people. <laughs> Dang, Brian. What, you about to come into some inheritance, man? Yeah. What you got we going on, that, man? Brian. <laughs> Crypto. <laughs> hey, it's coming down I like, the pipe. I like that, man. I, I like that joker trying to get that money. Look, man. Oh, Peddling God. crypto. Uh, it, it, look, y'all know I am not a greedy person nor am I a rich person, nor any of us uh, like that around here. But let me tell you, it is important for you to, to make an effort to be as successful as you possibly can in this life, all right? Um, when, you are, when you make good decisions and you work really hard and you make money and you become financially independent of the system it's a really really good thing all right uh another thing when you gain wealth view your wealth as a resource all right i've said this before on the podcast i don't care how much you own how many things you have how much money you have you should strive to always keep the mindset that you really own nothing. The things that you do have, that you have earned, are meant to be a resource for you to, for you to serve your community, the people around you, for you to make an impact on your community, the people around you. Um, and why do I say you don't own anything? Because you, you're... You ain't taking none of this crap you got with you, man. So just use it as a tool. Use it as a tool, man. All right? Don't become too attached to any material thing. Look, you're going to have stuff to sneak in, like this daggone Land Cruiser I got, man. I, I'm, I, 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 I border on getting too attached to this thing a lot of times. And so that's why I got to offer it up. I got to say, hey, Blake, you want to drive the Land Cruiser one day or something like that? You hey, never Brooke, said that. Want, yeah, I have. I told you to drive it, you man. You got mad when I moved it in the driveway today, 10 <laughs> Thank feet. You. Oh, I was just joking with you about that. Uh huh. But look, what, did you, what were you going to say? You did. There's you nothing did wrong. You guys know we are God fearing people around here. There is nothing wrong with striving to be successful. While serving Christ, there's nothing wrong with that. It is all about where your heart resides, right? What do you put your faith in? What do you put your faith in? Strive to be successful, man. 
I love it when people want more. That's the way it ought to be. Yeah. Uh, hey, man. People keep sending me this dang book. All right. That's the only one I've seen you get. No, there's there's been <laughs> you no, missed straight the other up. 11. There's been like a <laughs> No, I think there's been 3 times people have sent me this book. Come on, man. What the crap is wrong with y'all today, man? You're hogging the podcast. That's okay, what's wrong. I'm about to turn it over to Chili cuz I don't know what this dang <laughs> book is, man. Look, I got plenty I I got plenty enough to read in this book. There's right nothing here. wrong with I still ain't figured this book out. There's nothing and wrong with books like that. And people keep sending me this book. Uh You're suggesting that reading this, theological books is wrong. Okay. That's this, not this, true. This fella that sent me this book wrote me a dang No, old. no, no. That, this didn't come with that. No, uh-uh. Well, Babe, you just separate. need to stop. You just okay. need to stop. Somebody <laughs> sent me a long Quit thing. trying to make this a thing. That Brooke. came in Amazon with no There was a card but no name. I think Brooke Put her, I think it's that okay. Thing there. Chili, what the crap is this book people keep sending me, man? <clears throat> the Great Controversy, man. Ellen G. White. Okay, tell me about it, please. I ain't got much to say, man. It's Seventh Day Adventist. What is that? <laughs> you. It's a denomination of Christianity. Okay. You know what that is. We just watched a documentary. Is that the people that College are... College Dale, Tennessee, boy. Health, like, yeah. all about their diet that and stuff? centenarian thing we just watched. Okay. Yeah, they, they're they're pretty big on health. I mean, most of them probably don't really follow that very strict, but, you know, vegetarian, clean eating. I don't think I've ever met a fat seven-day Adventist. Okay. Oh, I have. You have? Oh, yeah. Oh, well. Do <laughs> you Do you know who this Ellen White is? She was the one who brought up the sect or the, what would it be called? What do you call that? The the group of seven day Adventists. Well, I've never met Miss Ellen, uh, but yeah, I know about her. Okay. Well, you tell me a little bit about her. Ain't much to say. She wrote that book right there. Okay. She, uh, She's the foundation of their, of their thing. Mm. So their denomination. Isn't she what sets them apart? Like her book. Well, tell is me what of- you know about this Ellen White, please. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know her. I mean, she's, uh, she's, yeah, she's a key figure in Seventh Day Adventist. She wrote that book amongst others, and uh, and they they follow her teachings. So is this book right here? Mm-hmm. Is this like their like the, their anthem or something? Like their What's so important about this book? This lady says, this is... That would go along with the Bible as... Is this like their Book of Mormon? Kind of? I mean, it's it's more of like a... uh, Of a story than than like a religious text, that book you're holding right there. I mean, it's... I guess you would say it's Ellen G. White's Revelations from God, yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's, you know, in addition to the Bible. Okay. Um, you should read that and know it, you know, if you're Seventh day Adventist. Okay. The mailman said they had a, uh, somebody send that book to everybody in the entire city where he lives. So that might have happened down here too. So th- there's got, there's got to be more to this book than what you're telling me, Chili. I mean, really, what do you know about it? Like, why are they so passionate about getting this book out? Why are you so do passionate they, about? Do they think it's like this lady had legitimate, yeah, pretty much special extra revelation? Yeah. Okay. She had the gift of prophecy. Yeah, I mean, basically, if you you know you you, you can read the Bible or whatever, but you're missing stuff if you don't read that. He refuses to take any feedback or anything I have to say on this topic. Do you notice that? <laughs> like he keeps taking it back to you and he won't look well, at me. Well, because Chili's the only one that he, he knows what this is. He studied this. Yeah, He's, he told me all about that one time on a mountain bike ride. <laughs> yeah. He talked about it for like 45 minutes. So he just doesn't <laughs> want to talk about it today. Did he I really? Mean, yeah. I'm just. Yeah. He knows exactly what this is. I, I, I'm telling you what it is. Like it's. You ask me direct questions. I mean, like anything. I I, I don't okay. got nothing to say, man. Okay. Is this a bunch of malarkey? 
Uh, well, that is a matter of opinion. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. From what I... I mean, I guess you can't be sure, right? But yeah, I mean, it's just... It's Ellen White just spouting off some some lady who just came out of nowhere and just you'd have to read the book to know what exactly she says but i mean how long ago was it written oh not long ago i don't know the exact year but not long ago at all like in the 90s <laughs> <laughs> this is this in the is 20th so, century okay trying to just get what chili's first car was at the beginning before we started this episode was like pulling freaking teeth that yeah this says First published in 1858. Okay. Sure. Okay. Same thing. 90s, 1858. Same thing. Well, not the 90s. <laughs> he was talking 1990s, did, I think. Did, did YouTube have anything to say about this? Well, what do you want to well, know, Chad? People say I mean, that it's just some bull and that she knew how to plant fruit trees. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you want to know? Say say what? That, uh, she's the closest thing to true Christianity after persecution had set in. To all religion as it is today. Yeah, I mean, what do you want to know? I mean, it's a it's a denomination. I mean, it's okay. There's there's well, Baptist, that, that's, there's that, that's really all I need to know because I don't agree with denomination. Okay, what do you not agree with? I like how you just shrug that off. What do you not agree with about it? Uh, I I don't I don't agree with it. First of all, well, no. What do you not agree with about denominations? The the um the division they create. But don't you think that the denominations were created as a consequence of division, not the other way around? That denominations created division. It depends. I I, I think I think it could go both ways. I think when you have an individual uh like it sounds like Ellen White. When you have an individual that claims they have some special knowledge. Um, she claims she had the gift of prophecy. Yeah, which is inaccurate. Biblically inaccurate. That's not one of the gifts of the Spirit? I mean, what Chad's saying is not wrong. She that they, There was a claim that Ellen G. White had special knowledge that was special. It was outside of the... Isn't that what prophecy is? A gift of special knowledge given to you by God? <laughs> answer why are you doing that just answer my question <laughs> pro, pro, prophets at all right where do prophets get their knowledge from prophets in the old testament of of scripture that we read prophets like I don't um, like you guys today not me i'm laughing at him <laughs> like jeremiah all of these books ezekiel daniel daniel um they they were their purpose and their gift was meant to reveal God's will to the people of Israel. That was their purpose. God's will in totality has now been revealed to mankind through the complete Bible. God's complete will has now been revealed from because the beginning to the end through the Holy Bible. So you're saying there is, if someone is claiming to be a prophet since the Bible was printed, they are lying. And there's no possible way God has given someone the gift of prophecy. Post, post the Bible being actually written. Mm hmm. No, no prophecy. No, I think that's ridiculous. Is that biblical or is that just your opinion? I, I mean, I'm going to have to look into that. Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I would like what not that I, I I don't think Ellen G. White was a prophet, but I'm I'm asking you, like, why? Why would you why would you say that? You just you got to look into it. I mean, why would I say what? I mean, you just made a claim. You just claim that there's no prophets. I don't I don't know why I would need anyone to reveal anything extra about God well, because to you me. don't know what still needs to be revealed. That would be the argument. That the, the the whole the whole thing has been revealed from beginning. Well, to you would end. argue that. Well, the argument would be that. Yeah, yes, what you think. 
But, you, but see, you're not aware of what needs to still right. be revealed. Couldn't a prophet? So, so yeah. I'm telling you what still needs to be revealed is, I mean, their argument. Couldn't a prophet come to a church or a community or a group and say, this is going to happen. I need you to prepare in this way because you're going to have to serve God and blah, blah, blah. I mean, if, if they did that, I would say, well, is that, has that been revealed in scripture? When they well, would there, say there is a, um, I don't know all the facts behind it, but there is a, I don't know if you'd call it a school of thought or, and uh, you know, people say that prophecy that it's done. And uh, I think there's one other gift of the spirit that's in the Bible that they say is, is no more. And people go back and forth on it, debate on it. And right. I don't, I've looked it up before, but I don't remember enough about it to comment on it. But that is a, that is a thought that there is no more prophecy. There's no more gift of prophecy because nothing else needs to be revealed. That is my thought. But I could, lo I love this conversation. Okay. Because well, that's, it, that's excellent. <laughs> no, because it gets to like <laughs> why we think what we think and stuff. Like, that's excellent. I mean, that's what I'm, that's why I'm asking you since you said that. I mean, just why would you say, because I'm not saying that. Well, you asked the question about denominations. Is yes. is the denomination a result of division, or is division a result of denomination? That's right, and I think it's both. Okay, I, th I think I think it's both. I think when you when you have someone like, well, I haven't read this lady's book. If when you have someone like Ellen, or you have someone like the guy who's the guy that wrote the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith. When you have someone that comes out and claims they have some sort of special knowledge, and they build a denomination based off of this special knowledge that they have, then that is done to create division intentionally by that person, because this these people who have done this have built a cult following and they become extremely wealthy. Yeah. They become, they, they, they are corrupt well, and that's the reason they do this. Well, because I, the, the, the Bible is the antithesis of that. I'm not saying that that's incorrect in certain circumstances, but I definitely think like when you look at the Protestant reformation and a lot of the figures that sprung out of that time, I don't, I mean, it was almost just a natural consequence of disagree. Like, I don't know that they were trying to create harmful division. You're right. You're, and I agree. There it was are, just like, hey, we disagree. This is wrong. This is, you know. There are many denominations that have been, that have formed because of division, mm. not to create division, but because of division. Yeah. Right. I, I agree with that. And I mean, cultural differences, right? Didn't yeah. that form a lot of denominations? Yeah. But, the the thing the reason that that's wrong is because the 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 scripture that comes to mind is when the apostle paul uh, is recorded by inspiration of the holy spirit saying i have become all things to all people if you if you want to if you want to not eat a certain thing because you think that that makes you good to go that's fine go ahead do that if if you want to observe a certain holiday because it it's important to you, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. But we don't have to be divided because of those things. So what you're saying is like basically I disagree with you about those things. Like if someone's like I think that I should be a vegan or, or vegetarian, you're like, "Well, yeah, I disagree with that, but why do we have to call ourselves different things? We why can do we have a, to We can be a part of the same body of Christ." Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yep. Well, why I, do, why do people have to attach things like that to their spiritual life? Why can't they just leave it as a human decision? You know what I mean? Like, why do they have to rope it into? Because most of the things, most of it's it's human nature. People want to attach that to their spiritual life because people want to have things that they can do, boxes that they can check. Yeah in order to make them feel like they're more holy. So that's a human thing. We desire to do that. That's the reason it happens, and that's the reason people observe all these... Observe? Observe all these things. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just interested in that book because people keep sending it to me. And while we're on the topic of Scripture... I wanted to share a scripture with you guys uh, since this this podcast is titled Why Chad Thinks So Highly of Himself. Mm. 
I'm going to hit y'all with this. I read this this morning. And Jesus put forth, forth a parable to those which were bidden, and he marked how they chose out of the chief rooms, saying unto them. So this is Jesus saying this parable. He's he's Jesus is at a at, at like a a dinner party here. All right. Jesus says, when you are bidden of any man, which means you're when you're invited by any man to a uh, a feast. This King James version uses wedding, a wedding feast. Sit, sit not down in the highest room or in the best place, lest a man more honorable than you be bidden of him to the same feast. And he that bade thee and, and him come and say to thee, give this man a place and thou begin with shame to take the lower room. Jesus is saying here, if you get invited to a feast somewhere, don't go on in there and think you're hot crap and sit down in the in the best seat in the house thinking that you're the most important person there. Because guess what? There might be somebody walk up in this place and, and the host of this gathering thinks that this other person is more important than you. And he comes up and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, buddy, uh, you're going to have to give this seat up because... Uh, somebody more important than you just showed up. And then guess what you got to do? You got to get up and go on to the back of the room and look like a fool because all the middle seats have done been took up, right? And so then you're going to be back there in the back. But when you're bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room so that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up to the higher Place and thou shalt have glory in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. That's what I read this morning. So mm. don't go sit in the highest daggone seat. Don't sit on your high horse, son, because you you prob you're going to get knocked off of it, and you're going to feel like a fool. Set yourself up for success when you walk up into the gathering, and if you think you're somebody. First of all, that's probably a problem. <laughs> but if you think you're somebody and you walk up into this place, just go ahead and sit in the back and you're going to be a lot better off when the feller that invited you says, hey, buddy, what are you doing back here in the back? Come on up here to the front. Well, it's um, I mean, but, yeah, that would. <laughs> yeah, that would make you feel bad, but it's less about how you feel and, and what happens to you. That, I think, is a good metaphor of not exalting yourself and lift and lifting yourself up, but letting God do that. Like think less of yourself, You're think right. low of yourself, be humble and let God be the one that brings you up to the front top seat and say, Hey, this is where you need to be. And don't put yourself there. And so in the natural, it would really stink in the example that he gave to have to be like, Oh dang. Now I thought I was somebody and I'm not, but in the supernatural, it's even worse to think that you're something and you're not. So think less of yourself and let God lift you up rather than you doing that for yourself. That's what hey, it means amen to, me. to that, Bishop. Well, and does that not apply to people like Ellen G. White? Yeah. and, and Thank the, you, Bishop Blake. Well, the argument for all of these other things or the question is, is the Bible complete or is it incomplete? Because if it's incomplete, then it warrants all these other books to be added to it, right? I mean, and but if it's complete, then that means nothing else should be added to it. So that's the question that you ask for all of these other um, religions or denominations that add their text or their books that are also a part of the religious text. I think you need to read Ellen's content before you start, like, just smashing her. Well... I don't like her. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to Deacon Chili. He looked like he had something to say. Well, that is great. What you just read, it, it, it illuminates why you should not think very highly of yourself, but why it doesn't answer. <laughs> you, you let off with, you were going to say why you think so highly of yourself. I mean, that's a different question. <laughs> Well, everybody on YouTube knows that title was clickbait. And Chad had to reference it <laughs> to make some sort of justification for the title being that. But <laughs> I think that verse was probably meaningful to Chad this morning because he randomly told us about it at breakfast yeah. this morning as it didn't apply to the topic we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so 
What did it mean to you? Were you thinking highly of yourself and you read that and thought, mm, I need to back back down a hair? Well, you know, when when people when people invite us to come to these events and these speaking engagements and all this, you know, they have a seat ready for you right there in the front, you know. Um, and I, I've just been thinking about it. I said, no, nah, I ain't doing that no more. When we go to these events, I'm going to sit in the back. And if they want me to come up there to the front, they can come and get me. Well, yeah, if they put you up there, you can sit there. But, you know, I think you're thinking of it very practical. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm thinking of it practical. Like you're yeah, thinking of a, when I, I go to an event, this is the Bible's not telling you it's like, man, yeah, that works. There but is it, a but, yeah, that, but it's, it's a not practical. saying, hey, man, when you go to the to the wedding, the, you know, it's really important that you, it's more about the posture of your heart and how you think about yourself. I, I agree. I, I totally, Especially when there's an assigned seat. I, I totally agree <laughs> with with the spiritual application. They've preemptively hey, called look, you to the He's going to say, I know you've got my name on that seat, but I'm going to sit back here. And if you want me to sit up there, you can come back here and get me. <laughs> That's that's my policy from now They've on. They preemptively called him to the front, and he's still sitting in the back. That's how <laughs> that's how humble he I is. Into that Deacon Chili. <laughs> <coughs> got it, boy. You got it. Yeah. Son, y'all firing me up in here today, boy. Getting in the word oh, up in here crap. today, talking about the practical application and the <laughs> spiritual application. Deacon Chili dropping it like it's hot. Bishop Blake coming in with the with the sidewinder. Hey, what am I? Let me let me read cardinal. you this. I'm a cardinal. Poppy said to read this. This is in Revelation. Oh. I, I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. But what was this book referring to, though? Was that Revelation? Revelation or the Bible? I don't know. We'd have to, I think it was Revelation. Look at the original text, maybe get more understanding. But Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, that's y'all. That's y'all. Um, uh, word for the day. I wanted to share that with y'all. Uh, thank y'all. <laughs> All right. Enough said. <laughs> so, um, could be, uh, you know, we had a, we had a rite of passage mission this past weekend. And, uh, I don't want to brush over that because, you know, there's always a lot of good things that happen on the rite of passage. Um, if y'all don't know what that is, it's a mission that we run here at 307 Project. It's very simple. It's a 24-hour continuous movement with no sitting. So it's a really simple thing. And had a great team this weekend. Uh, Chili, you referenced something that, that Blake had mentioned, and I didn't know what y'all was talking about. <laughs> Yeah, you don't remember what Blake said at the end? No, I don't. Oh, okay. Well, Blake had some good stuff to say, and I suppose you don't pay much attention. That's that's not real good. But Well, it's probably because I had been up for 24 hours. Well, working. so had I, but uh, there was a... You're younger than me. Yeah. We already <clears throat> talked about this. Our friendship's come, coming to a close, as a matter of fact. Yeah, friendship. Isn't, isn't that interesting? When you're 70, I'll be in my 50s. Yeah. That ain't going to work. It ain't going to work. Yeah. Oh, well. Let's uh, see how that pans out. Well, anyway, I think a lot of people, I think Blake has felt this because he's mentioned it before. And I, I have, I think I see so many people struggle with uh, their life being diminished and and their spirit being beat down by how much they worry and care about the opinions of others about things that don't matter you know and and for me i just it make that nothing will make me much sadder than seeing somebody be weighed down by that because it's 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 chains on you like it's like chains that 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 are so unnecessary and, and you see it hinder people from doing stuff that 
would benefit them and benefit other people and make their life better. I, it's just, it's very sad. And, and a lot of people struggle with that. And, uh, Blake just, re- I mean, he boiled it down pretty well, but the problem still is how do you get people to really get that, like get it and, and change the way that they think and see it. You, you see what I'm saying? Because you can grasp, okay, here's why I shouldn't care about what other people think and opinions like that just don't shouldn't influence my decision, but it's still, they still can't let it go. Oh, boo boo. You just have some input on this topic. How did you boil it down? Blake? Well, I mean, I was just, all I said was, I mean, there were people talking about themselves, how they view themselves and how this course kind of gave them, you know, something else, uh, to be, I guess, confident in, and then, um, yeah, it's, it's viewing yourself, other people viewing whatever. Yeah, it's just a false view of how they view other people and things. And so basically all I said is that we all have a, uh, created value and like a worth. And so the things we do might give us confidence, but it shouldn't really affect how we feel about ourselves or how we see ourselves because we have this created worth from God and it's outweighs anything that we could ever do. And the same goes for other people that they also have equally created worth and value as us because God created them. And so we should view them in that light, not, uh, not based off of the things that they do or their accomplishments, or even in my opinion, how they, how they treat you, Mm -hmm. uh, that shouldn't affect the way you view them for their worth. And so that was really what I'd said. So it goes both ways, how we view ourselves and then how we view other people. How we view others. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And that, to me, probably that's the harder one for me that I have to work on is, you know, viewing other people that way and and actually uh, appreciating them for their value, even when, like, maybe some people just really get on your nerves. Yeah, yeah. Because they're created in the likeness and image of God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this applies to a conversation Brooke and I were just having, what, a night ago, boo-boo? both outwardly how I was telling you how I view other people. Mm -hmm. And then also it applies to the struggle. I think you, you have at times in, in a sense of constantly thinking or worrying about what other people are thinking. So that's the inward. I, and I struggle more with the outward. And I think like when Jilly brought this up, my mind was like, I've been wanting to talk about this for a while because I don't, I hear a lot of people say, you shouldn't give a crap what other people think. And I don't think that that statement alone, just sitting alone is true. Like, I don't think you should go through the world acting however you impulsively feel like acting and not worry about what other people think about you. Like, it's like when someone's talking about somebody, they're like, they'll say things like, you know, everybody has good things to say about this guy. And that's how you have credibility for people. And it's like people who you know are healthy and they're good people and you know that they care about you, you should care what they think about you. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And I think, but, but I think our culture is very much like be exactly who you are. Don't give a crap what other people think, you know, just say exactly how you're feeling. If you hurt somebody, it's okay. It's on them. It's like, I think that there's true. Like, yes, I think it's a gray area of using your discretion to care what people think. Now I care i don't give a crap what the guy on youtube who said i had big hands that means i have high testosterone so i'm gonna cheat on you or like the person on the street when i'm dressed like weird like i don't i don't outwardly do anything like i drive an old crappy car i don't dress nice i genuinely don't care what strangers think about me but i do care about what impact i have on them and you can argue that that means you care what they think where I'm going with this is I care about how I impact my close friends and my family and my community. I do care what they think about me. I don't want to walk away from my mother-in-law or my good friend at the gym and then think, wow, she's mean or she's rude or she's careless or thought like, I don't want that. I want them to to know. I don't know. Does that make 
No, I mean, it's splitting hairs. Like, you're talking about two different things. You're talking about, do you care about when people have opinions about you or thoughts about you that are about you, your, who you are, your character, like not how you care about how you treat others. I mean, how is that related all to how caring about how they because think about you. how you treat them will impact how they think about you. Well, okay. Let that be. But well, that's what she's saying is that the, the, her care for how people think about her influence the way that you treat them. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like that is when, when I'm interacting with a family member or someone I care about, I am thinking, how are they going to think about the way I just handled that or the way that I'm speaking to them? Like, what are they going to think about? I do. I think about what, are yeah. they, but I'm borderline unhealthy with this. Like it's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Cause that, that even in itself has to be measured. Right. That's what, yeah, it comes well, down to what is your standard for how you treat people? Is right. it, is it measured by how well they like you or by, yeah, I, I mean, mean, really, I mean, we're all things. Christian. So is it measured by the Bible? Like, do you treat people how the Bible says to treat them? And then however they view you is how they view you. Or, or do you treat them in a way that they will always like you, but maybe it it's twisted with what the Bible says. I think that's where it comes down to like a, yeah. you know, if you're really digging down to the root of it. Yeah. And I think the, the, the foundation of human need is to be wanted and loved. So I would argue that everybody is changing their behavior around certain people to want them to like them and think highly of them. But, I don't, I don't know. It's definitely, I'll make up in my head things that people think about me because I think I treated them poorly. And like, that's just a freaking disaster. Like that ain't helping nobody. Yeah. Well, I think, I think my, we had a conversation about this the other night. I think the main part of this that really I struggle with is how I view the value of other people. Because I really struggle seeing the humanity of people. Um, I tend to naturally view people as basically parts or tools to accomplish a mission. Even even like in the ROP course, for instance, I even told the class, like this is the first class I've re actually remembered everybody's name because when I'm viewing this team of people that have to get through this mission, I'm viewing each person as just this cog in the machine and they're con they're, I, I'm, I'm looking for them to perform the task that they can perform within this machine in order to get the entire machine to the end of the mission. And I have a lot of trouble seeing each person as an actual, like, living being that is feeling things and struggling with things and has strengths but weaknesses and insecurities and and all of these things, right? And what it what it creates in my life is I see people as either useful or not useful. As soon as soon as you are not contributing to the organism in order to move it forward, you are not useful. You become a cancer. And then I, I'm, I'm ready for you to go away because you're no longer functioning within the unit. Is right? That, is that during missions or during everyday life? It's, 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 it's my whole life. Like, I don't have friends. I, I have you, I have Chili and Blake. And you guys are my closest friends because we have a common mission. We're all on the same mission. And we each have our purposes that we serve within the team to execute the mission, right? I, I, I even do this with, um, even with 
animals. That's what's so y'all laugh at me for this shaky legs goat. Like I'll be out there petting this animal and like, it's a revelation to me when I'm petting this animal and I'm, I, I, I actually remember that this is actually a living thing. Like it feels pain. It feels joy. This is actually a living thing. And not just something that is bringing me enjoyment, right? Serving, serving the, well, if you could call that in the sense of mission, this thing is bringing me enjoyment. No, it's an actual living thing that is more than just something that brings me enjoyment, which if I stay in that mode, the moment that I'm not enjoying that anymore, that thing becomes useless to me. You see what I'm saying? Are you at peace with that, living that way? Or? No, it's absolutely terrible. No, it's absolutely terrible. And, and I, the only thing that I can consider is because this was my life uh, in the military. This was my life. It, it was, you are part of this unit that had a common goal you had a purpose to serve within the within this machine, and every single per person had a purpose. And as soon as you couldn't serve that purpose, you were you you were no longer needed. You were gone, right? So it's like the way I was. It's the way I was programmed to think about other people from a very young age. 19 years old. And so, yes, like that's, it sucks because I know I could serve people way better. And I think I could have a richer life. Like Brooke was even just saying the other day, like you should, why you should have friends outside of the mission that is three or seven project. Like you should have friends that you just go eat dinner with or I have no interest in that because they're not, they're not useful in my life. And, and the weird thing about this conversation is, is a lot of you guys listening to this, you're probably thinking, Oh, Chad, you're just a selfish you're just a selfish piece of crap. You know, whatever you might be thinking, right? I'm not doing this intentionally. Like even even if it does sound selfish, what it is is I'm so oriented toward the mission or the task that in my mind is always at the top of any other priority. So I'm not doing it purposefully. And to be honest with you, Although I know I need to change somehow, I don't know how I, I, I changed my way of viewing people and things and being able to see the human. I don't know yet how I changed that. Although I do need to shift that. There is also great power in the way that I operate. In terms of accomplishing things. Because you, uh, when you view things the way I view them, you only are keeping the people and things in place who are useful. And there's no fat. There's no, there's no ancillary concerns. There's, no, there's way less drama. There, there, there's no fat, right? So there is great power in that. But it is... <laughs> different way of thinking <laughs> well you can you could argue that being able to see the humanity and people and empathize with people would actually benefit you carrying out the mission oh a hundred percent which in that case doesn't mean you have to operate any differently actually it just means you have to be able to do that like you still could operate the way you operate yeah yeah i mean it i could be better say though. it's an advantage yeah. To think that way of the way you operate, I think that's two separate things. I think you could see people differently, but still operate the same way. Yeah, yeah, you actually could, but it would help other areas of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. If you saw the humanity in people like like you're talking about, and 
I think the reason that you are that way, like it is obvious, like you said, it was programmed in you. But what's interesting is you don't need to drive out the mission oriented aspect of who you are. I think what would make you change the way, the way you're seeing people, if that's even really possible, like to change things like that about you is to recognize the need for it, for the mission. Yeah. I'm mean, seriously, yeah, I like, agree. you know, like, well, you feel like you could do anything. Like if a need came up in the mission, I think you would say, I can figure, figure out how to fill it no matter what it is. And you could argue that's a need. Not even for your personal life. Like she said, you know, you need friends or whatever. Well, you're like, well, I don't even care about that. Well, then, then you don't care. But so there's not a need in your personal life. Then say that, but there would be in, in maybe aspects of what you do. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and the, the, I, I, I totally, I'm thinking about this along those lines, Chili, because this is a, a, as, <coughs> as, as hurtful as some of you might take this. Um, when we're doing something like the ROP course, right? If you are a person within that machine that just becomes a mashed up bag of crap, like I don't care about you anymore. Like, you, you know, I, 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 at, at that point, I just look at it as you're unprepared. You're not, you're not contributing. Go away. Right. And so, but there's a big opportunity for me to serve and encourage and build those people up that are in that moment where they're no longer contributing anything. Um, and I just, I, I, my mind doesn't view it that way. So I'm missing out on a huge opportunity to serve the mission here at 307 Project, which is serving others, building other people well, up. That's what I was about to ask. What is the mission of the ROP course? The is mission it, is it to is it to move for 24 hours on our end? Is that our mission? No. Or, or is it to yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's to that's what I'm saying. It's I mean, to build other people up through an through an experience that is m more often than not the hardest thing that these people who have ever have ever endured. I mean, um, that's the mission and, 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 and that can be done. That building up of the individual can be done even if they don't make it the full 24 hours. Yeah. Well, don't you guys, or I think I've heard you babe talk about like failure is where you learn and failure, like yeah. how, how crucial failure is. So I think in those moments, yeah, if you could see people's humanity and you could see in their heart and, I think you could have a huge oh, impact. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, quite honestly, yeah, we don't know what the mission of the ROP course is until we meet the people who are who who have come and tell us, you know, their reason for being there. I mean, that then mm -hmm. then then you know what it is. We don't know until it freaking starts. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think if you look at it like as as our mission of that is to just move for 24 hours or, or moved for 24 hours with a team or whatever. That's the wrong way of looking at what we do. Mm -hmm. I told him when we were talking about this a few nights ago that I think his inability, I, first of all, I think it's really cool that you're talking about this, boo. I did not expect you to bring this to the masses. I thought this was something you would keep private, but I think a lot of people could benefit from it. And I think it's cool that you're sharing it. Well, I'm a public figure, so. You're doing what you said on Jamie's podcast about putting it out. Yeah, um, public figure. No. So, dang it. What was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say that I think that since you struggle to see the humanity and the empathy and kind of, I think one of the things you struggle with, it is empathy, but just to simplify it is like, you can't look at somebody and based on their posture and their actions and what they're saying and doing what you can't guess what they're feeling or nor are you interested in trying to figure out what they're feeling. And I told him, I was like, I don't think without that, you don't understand what an impact you're making. It's like when we have races or even when I photograph y'all's events, 
it's like I feel so much just witnessing these people experiencing something. And it's like, I don't think you can tap into that, really. I don't. I don't. Well, I don't think it's a problem. I, I don't think the feeling stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. Like, I think you can get way too in the weeds with worried about what other people are feeling or trying to feel what they're feeling. Why isn't it okay to celebrate if you can tell someone's having a breakthrough and like they are emotional or they are just filled with joy and like when they finish rock they get out of that van and they're so excited and happy and giddy why can't you celebrate that what's wrong with that it's a uh, feeling i don't care about feelings i think what? that's that that's very detrimental what? to focus on feelings what i think what just explain that a little bit more i don't geez feelings are you are useless and what other people are feeling is useless i mean when someone isn't love a feeling i wouldn't know so feelings are, are completely useless they'll they'll get you killed and they're it's only a negative to, to worry about feelings and how other people are feeling but this is where it does come back to more mission oriented like chad was talking about but still applies to trying to do you think caring is a feeling? Cause I don't think that's a feeling, but, but I think you should care about the people and try to help them with what they're there for and trying to get out of it. How can you care for people? Well, if you have no idea how they feel, why would that be? Why would that be necessary? To if you're approaching a person to care for them, if you have no idea how they feel in that moment, how do you care for them? Well, if you don't know if they're happy or sad or what their needs are, yeah, you can do it. You what their needs are. That's well, exactly. Yeah, it. I do it, but I, I, I do have to lean more toward, toward, um, Chili's argument on this. Like for me, it's more of, I'm witnessing this person's action and demeanor. I, and that's, I want to serve them in a way that improves their action right. and their demeanor. Yeah, we're not therapists. Yeah, so so I I I might could take I could easily by witnessing a a, a rock team participants action and demeanor, I could guess pretty accurately how they are feeling. But that doesn't matter to me because I don't want to influence their feelings. I want to influence their actions and their demeanors. Yeah, How do you separate? Feelings, yeah, we're not yeah. trying to make people feel better. Feelings have a place. I mean, I think feelings are good. God created them and gave them to us, but they, they're serving you in the manner of giving you that information. You understand by how they feel then that's how you're able to serve them. In other words, yes. In other words, I could say I could say, and it would not be inappropriate for me to say, Hey man, I know this freaking sucks. I know it hurts. I know you feel overwhelmed. But we aside from all this, this is what we this is what we're going to do. I am not in order advocating for anybody walking up to anybody on any course and saying, "How are you feeling?" <laughs> I am saying outwardly when you approach somebody you read them. And that's what I was saying at the beginning of this is like, I don't walk around when I'm taking photos, when I'm experiencing people, experiencing things during y'all's courses. I don't walk around and say like, how are you feeling so far about this ROP course? I, I just see joy. I see happiness. I see, and I infer that they are feeling those things and I celebrate that. Here's the key to this for me. I, I need, I think I need to be able to acknowledge the fact that someone is feeling something like I, I need to be, I need to just be, that needs to register with me. It's see, a tool. See, that doesn't be. And the reason that that needs to register with me, I don't need to play into that. That doesn't need to register with me because I need to play into that. That needs to register with me so that I can see that person as a human being. That's what I was talking to you about my about my shaky legs goat. <laughs> like 
that's part of the moments that I see the livingness of that creature are the moments that I recognize that this creature feels pain. It, it feels fear. It feels all of these things that makes me be that rem, that is what reminds me that, wow, this thing is alive. It's not just a thing. Now I don't have to play into that stuff, but that for me is how the two how how that interfaces with me being able to see the humanness of other people is just acknowledging the fact that they do feel certain ways and yeah that's the way i see it at least at this moment this is very beginning stages of me i'll probably have this all worked out by the time i'm in my 60s on your deathbed yeah i told him we should get therapy and he didn't like that at all i said how if you have a behavior that you've had ingrained in you which i we talked about we think some of this also comes from childhood but when you have a behavior you've carried with you for decades how could you expect to get rid of it without the help of others well that's what a therapist would tell them it's your childhood well <laughs> It might be. It, it's like in, it's like in buds, man. It's like in buds. I, I mean, I think that's maybe where it really started. You know, you knew all these guys in your class, were you? Well, as they just quit in droves, as they quit, there was never a single moment where I where I felt where where I had any thought about them quit like it didn't matter to me it was like yeah i i know you you're my fr you're actually you might actually be my friend mm -hmm. but you quit it's like okay go away because you're no longer you're no longer pulling your weight yes go away and that makes sense like i know you loved tubs a lot and i can see how you had to put up that like coping or that wall when like when your best buddies quit, you can't take a moment to be like, "Oh, that sucks." Yeah, exactly. you don't have the space for that. Or, or or even give them a call afterwards and be like, encourage them or something. You know what I mean? No, it didn't matter to me. Yeah, gone. You know. Well, you learned it out of necessity, like you've talked about before. So you'll learn this again in necessity when you have to. I mean, there'll come a point where you'll have you'll have to do this for somebody. Yeah, well, I, I think there's plenty of scenarios that that we're that I am faced with in our um, purpose here at Three Seven Project, where I, I need to do a better job at this. Like, I feel like there's a necessity for it. Well, there's a need for it, there's but a there's need a, for it. There's yeah. not a necessity to that's the true. point to where you're like. I have to do this or things are going to get extremely bad. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's, that's such a, I feel like some of my behavior that I'm working on right now is like that. It's like, I could keep on the rest of my life like this and be somewhat like still be successful and still function great as a person. But it's like, are you going to put things on that line? Like, okay, I know I need to work on this. Is my life going to crumble if I don't No. Okay. I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. It's like, no, you know, like we talked about, we were talking about just marriage and like, you know, you could serve better in the business. You know, you could be a better husband. I mean, it's like, but again, I'm not going to leave you. The business will still do well, even if you don't improve this. It's like, it, that would be a hard decision to make. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, well, I mean, you do things because they're right or wrong. Is it right yeah. to fix that? Like, is, is it wrong to not be doing that? Okay, yeah. Is it right to fix it? Well, the answer was just answered by the previous question. Yeah, it needs to be fixed. So then it's just a decision of am I going to do the right thing or the wrong thing? Because the the result of not doing it shouldn't influence whether you do it or not. You should do it whether it's right to do yeah, man, or man, it's but, wrong to do. But man, it takes work. Oh, well, yeah, it takes it's, work. It's, I mean, it's death. It's death yeah, to death your to former self. self. It's death to self. How do you do that, though? Like there's a, everybody probably listening to this podcast right now has a behavior change that they really want to make. 
You How? can't do it all. You can't. I mean, y'all, this might be preachy to you, but you can't do these things on your own. Like right. Chili was like, how do you make this happen? How do you view people? Like that happened for me because it was just truly a, just something that the Holy Spirit showed me. Like, hey, you got to quit viewing people like this. Uh, you know, it, like that was something that was laid on my heart that you're, you're not viewing people for the worth that I've given them. And that's what you need to start doing. And I recognize that. I recognize where it came from. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm able to do that. I Before that, I would have said, I crap on it, man. This guy's treating me like this and being a jerk and whatever. I'm not even going to fool with him no more. But no, that's not that's not okay. That's what I felt like. So it's not these, there's no like life hack to it of, hey, try this, try that. Like I, to me, you you know what needs to change or needs to be fixed in your life whenever it's revealed to you. And the time that that, like my prayer daily is just for God to search my heart and show me things that are impure, that that I'm not, uh, you know, that I don't see, that I'm overlooking, that I'm missing. And there was one, you know, like those things come up pretty regular for me. And I think that's why, because that's what I want. That's what I ask for. I think that, that happens for a lot of people that things are revealed to them within themselves alone. Like you pray enough. And I think God has the, obviously he has the authority to do whatever he wants in you. But I think a lot of people wait for that for too long. Like they, they just keep praying and kind of sitting idle with whatever it is they need to change. Like God will reveal this to me. God will change me. And it's like, no, that's why God gave you the body of Christ. That's why <laughs> He gave you these other people who believe what you believe and who can challenge you and who you can bounce things off of and who can say, hey, I do still see that behavior in you. Like, what can I do? I don't know. I just feel like community and even what y'all have, like just the three of you guys being close and just you sharing this openly with us that like this is something you want to change is like the first step. You're sharing it with people who love you, who will also hold you accountable yeah, and Chilean, you're like, Chilean Blake, call me out all yeah, the time. And you're like, I'm on this journey. And to me, that's like, that's the best way to at least facilitate change is to use the people around you that you trust and love. Like, I don't know. I just think. Yeah, that's a tool you can use to, to help uh, follow through with decisions you make to do things like for other people to be watching you and permission to so that can definitely build consistency in what you see is wrong but i think the actual seeing of it that it's wrong like we don't know what's right or wrong aside from what god shows us through his word or yeah. through prayer or, mm -hmm. or thought and so once we realize that it is on us to to change that and and those are tools we can use to be consistent in that change so yeah. when you see something and you say okay, I'm thinking about this. Then you look at it. Is this right or is it wrong? And if it's right, then you keep doing it regardless of what's, what it's causing because it's right by the Bible. But if it's wrong, then you change it regardless of what's causing. Like you could get by with it or not, but you change it because it's wrong. And so I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. It, it is a, a strange conversation that um, like, if you tell me something is wrong with the way that I'm acting, for instance, if, if you were to tell me, Chad, you really don't see the humanity in people. That's not a good, that's not a good way to, to live. Uh, if uh, that don't, that don't mean nothing, don't mean to, me. nothing to you. I, I'm just going to be like, what are you freaking talking about, dude? Like, no, the way, the way I'm acting is working out really well for me. <laughs> so, until until I see myself that that is incorrect, and how is that? I, I do have to believe that that is revealed to me by the Holy Spirit in Which me. can sometimes come through other people, so you can't always just shut somebody out because it can, like, I do believe that God can use other people to share things with yeah, you. And, yeah. and so I, it's not always, but, but it, but it in, could happen. But in my, yeah, but in my own power, if you tell me something, yeah. that something is wrong, I'm just like, well, that's, that's your opinion, right? Yeah. Because all right and wrong out. I mean, to be on, you, you, you try to get to the bottom of this and in all concept of right and wrong, if you, you, you have to have 
a written st a written standard that you're going off of because if you don't have that then it is all a matter of your opinion you're like a reed in the wind yeah it's there is no morality without a a, a clearly laid out standard by some authority that is l larger than your opinion mm -hmm. um can I clarify too? I think y'all heard, like, I don't think y'all were getting what I was saying. Like, I'm not saying that your community should, I agree with what you're saying, that the, you have to be in a mindset of searching yourself for your character flaws and what you want to improve. People around you telling you you're screwing up, other than husband and wife, I think for me is safe. But I, I'm saying once you have that, like you, like once you have that revelation, you bring it to people to help walk through it with, you know. Yeah, just, yeah. Like, I don't, I definitely don't think, Blake, that people, friends and family should be coming to you like, oh, hey, I see you doing this, you know, like, yeah. I don't think that's going to go very well. Yeah. Just um, for the record. No, I see what you're saying, boo boo. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think the theme of all of this that we've talked about is, you know, from what Brooke said and what we started with, even to here, it's like it's all coming down to the root of uh, of right and wrong. And do we live our life based off of right and wrong or off of how we think other people will feel or or how much we can get by? You know, what's what's the result going to be if I continue this wrong behavior? Can I can I run for, you know, another 30 years on this? Uh can I still maintain some sort of relationship with my friends and family, uh, even if maybe I'm treating them a little bit different just so they like me? Can, am I living based off of right or wrong or based off of really results? I mean, it's kind of a standards versus results thing we're talking about. Like, what can you get by with or what's right or wrong? So you do the right thing or the wrong thing, not based off of the result it's going to yield or or who's going to like you or not like you. Yeah. Well, like Chili referenced earlier, if in my, in, in the case of the specific example that I have presented of myself, the res, the result yielded will actually be a greater result. Yeah. If I do do what's right, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the case most of the time. Yeah. There'll be a lot of work. It'll be long-term. It's not going to be this quick turnaround thing. But in the end, if you start working on this now, a year, five years from now, you'll look back and say, dang, look at how much better my life, even aside from the business, like just your personal life and and the, the people that do come to train with us, how their lives will be changed on a, on a greater scale. And I think it's applicable everywhere. Yeah, I mean, doing do right or do wrong. Yeah, and it comes down to whether you seek righteousness or not. If you want, I mean, you have to 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 reject all of the wrong and to start seeking righteousness. You have to want to do that more than you want to do wrong. Yeah, and it really does come down to that. Now, how you manipulate that, I don't know. But the process of changing something that is a part of your sinful nature, no matter what it is, whether it's how you see people or, or a sin that you fall into repeatedly. It's literally a process of death. That's why we say death to self, because a part of you that exists, a part of your sinful nature that is inherently in you has to die. It literally has to die. It, it and, and death, I'm just saying that because any change you want to make, I think people give up or quit or don't even want to do it because they think it's an easy process. It's a death I know none yeah. of us have died, but it ain't easy. You can see how uncomfortable it is. <laughs> it freaking people. sucks. Yeah. Go freaking burn your hand off and let you, you, and let a big chunk of your flesh die and see how that feels. That's what has to happen inside of you, literally, for it to happen, for it to change. So, if you're not ready for that or don't want that, that ain't then it ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good, Chili. And, 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 so I, 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 I agree with you hundred percent. And that's what makes me. So that's what makes me. That's what makes this scenario scary for me is because like you said, like 
I I recognize that. And in this 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 thing that I'm talking about that I'm struggling with, like I recognize how how I'm going to have to change my actions in order to change this this part of me or the way I think and like that is uncomfortable <laughs> to me. And so I hesitate. Yeah, part of you's dying. Yeah. It it is really uncomfortable to me. So like just initially thinking about this I, what what is what it what are the action steps that I've been thinking about over the last few days since I've really me and Brooke really talked through this? Well, the very beginning action steps for me is because I'm in such such it's actually great because I'm in such a unique place to be able to serve people who might not be useful anymore in the missions that we run. It's like, I want to start looking for those opportunities. And then no matter how uncomfortable it is for me, I want to, when I see that opportunity, I I want to try to make, I want to make an effort to engage that person. Um, and try to build them up even though they're in a place where they're no longer useful. That's the practical side. That, that'll be painful to me to do yeah. that. The other thing is, um, for instance, uh, Boss Lightning hit me up on text yesterday. Boss Lightning is a huge, has been a huge mentor to me as a young man. He was my SEAL mentor. But, you know, Boss Lightning ain't part of the mission no more, man. Like, he just ain't. And so, for me last night to respond to his text and then say, hey, man, you should come out of the house and spend a, spend a day with me or something. That is like a friendship outside of... The mission. There's no there's no purpose to it. It's just like, hey, yeah, let's set aside a day just to hang out as as buddies, you know? And so like even just me responding to that text, like I know y'all think that's crazy, but m- my natural reaction would be just to never respond to that. Like it, and there's nothing against anybody. It's nothing against him. It's it's not because he did anything to me. I mean, gosh, the dude changed my life. But my natural reaction is I, I I have other things to do. I'm not I'm not going there. I'm not gonna be perfect to this, man. I'm just telling you, like that is for me, just responding to that text to an old friend was not natural for the way that I operate. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think when you start to do that, you'll find probably that there is purpose in those relationships that you didn't like, you know, things that you'll gain from it that you didn't really know you would want or need or would like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start to have that and maybe the first while it's uncomfortable or you don't like it, but then you'll, you'll, I mean, I think you'll find that, that it's actually good and that you do end up liking it with some people. Maybe so. Because God did create us for community. I mean, like to have companions and partners and, live in community together and not just to be isolated with just a couple people. This so. runs so deep in me that I cringe at the word relationship. Oh, I know. I cringe at that. Well, and that's what you said is how you have to start looking at it as when they, when that stuff, when these opportunities present themselves, you have to view it as an opportunity and not a oh, gosh problem or just discard. So up to this point, you viewed it as just, this is just a, a, a nuisance, you know, yeah, and not an opportunity. So you have to actually look at it, just like you said. I, I think that's the practical side of things to changing it. If you know that's what you decide you want to do and need to do, then that that's a great way to actually execute on that. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Well, I've talked my dang face off. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we wait. got some super chats too, so save yeah. time. Oh for yeah, that. and we got to do our we got to do your segment. We got to wrap wrap up your segment. Well, I have two things too. Okay, real quick. I wanted to tell Chili that last night I was doing stretching on YouTube, and a Bob Ross video popped up, and so I was like, "Huh." So I was just sitting, and Chad was on the couch behind me on his phone, and I turned on that Bob Ross, and I'm not joking. Nine minutes went by like that. I grew up on Bob. Okay, we've never watched it, and then I turned halfway through to look, and Chad's phone is on the table, face down, and he's just like this. <laughs> yeah. And he watched the whole thing. I went to bed yeah. and I was like, do you want me to turn this off? He was painting a waterfall. I was like, do you want me to turn this off? And Chad's like, nah. <laughs> and he watched the whole thing. That dude was an OG, man. It's an excellent program. I've never, I, I totally understand the hype now. I did not get it. I can't pinpoint what the hype is, but just like the way he talks and the things he says. And it's like, good. I don't know. I like to study people like that. People who people who are like like Bob Ross. I mean, he's a daggone icon. Yeah. Like there you don't get to be Bob Ross without <laughs> there being something special about you. Like you know, he I, was I in the that. military for like 20 years or something. Bob Ross mm -hmm. was? What? Yep. He was a cool dude. Yeah, he, interesting guy. Yeah. He had I couldn't believe last night we both we don't watch TV like we don't sit and just watch TV like we do things. And mm -hmm. and so for us to sit and watch that, I was like, what the heck? Robbie Ross. Second thing is, I just found out an hour and a half ago that it's Chad and I's 11th wedding anniversary today. How about that? Happy anniversary. <laughs> yeah, Chad told us about that this morning. No, he didn't. Yeah, You lie. You are lying. Look, Blake's had that. Now he won't look at me. That fool remembered. He did not. <laughs> Wait till you get home and see what he's done for you. He's got nice stuff. Oh, you're out. really trying to screw me over now. <laughs> well, I forgot too. Somebody, Kelsey, texted us in a group and said, happy anniversary, 11 years. And I was like, oh, well. Yeah, I've told y'all before. I, I don't I do not do dates and special days. and. Oops christmases and all this stuff i don't do that stuff man 11 years is a long time to be married though boo mm -hmm. pretty what's proud that, of that? The, is that the silver one silver you're supposed to give a gift for the milestones you know does queenie well, get that 11 is is that queenie? Oh, yeah i guarantee you queenie gets it uh, 11 ain't even a milestone though like it's That's like true. 10 and 20 yeah it's probably just the decades yeah yeah, yeah 11 is just you just pass over that you probably yeah. missed 10 though that was probably a big one we did we forgot my mom <laughs> told us last year on our anniversary that it was our anniversary <laughs> oops um okay i'll i'll reveal whose car wait think who drove what vehicle first nope that sounds bad help me who it, what everybody's first car was. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. yeah. Thank you. What everybody's <laughs> first car was. Well, the I think the dates give it away. How could y'all's even be an 06? Okay, so everybody guessed that the Pontiac was mine. Oh, well. And I'm like, you guys are so, you men on YouTube, y'all are so sexist. <laughs> the one car that's not a truck, they're like, oh, yeah, that was definitely biscuits. Like, of course y'all did A lot that. of them just left a car out and just picked y'all three. I know. <laughs> what the crap? They just picked from four cars and spread them amongst you Because they can't see you? Um, I didn't see anybody that got it right. Maybe I missed it. Well, you had, um, wasn't there two F, uh, F250s? Yeah, but yeah. they were different year and color. Okay, so here we go. So going backwards, 1979 brown f 250 Ford F250. That was Blake's. No. <laughs> that was Chad's. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. That, that. Oh, wait, sorry. Okay, so the 79 Brown F4 250 was yours. That was a beautiful truck. That truck called, was bad. called Brown Sugar. <laughs> we, we bought that truck um, from some old guy. Yeah, I mean it was it was we had it painted, put some wheels and tires on it. It had a 351 modified engine in it. That was a beautiful truck. That truck probably worth twenty five, thirty thousand dollars today. Oh yeah, easy. I bet I bet I think we paid 
twenty five hundred dollars for it. Yeah, that was that's probably the nicest truck I ever owned, other than my L- LC, of course. Mm. Okay, next was a ninety seven gold Ford Ranger, and that was my car. That thing was a piece of junk. Well, it never let you down. No, but we it wouldn't pull a greasy string out of a cat's butt. Though. No, it was a four cylinder, and it would going up a little hill. It would top out at about forty miles an hour if you had two people in it. I remember you used to try to pull up that hill on two seventy eight, going up toward the power line up there, and that song gonna be strung out as hard as it could go. It was bad. Yeah, it was bad. Um, ninety two bl- blue Ford F two fifty. Well, sorry, that was Blake's. Yep, that was mine. Yeah, tell them about that truck, Blake. You got <laughs> gifted that truck, didn't yep, you? That, huh? Yeah, that was Chad's old truck before he went off to the military. I, he, uh, yeah, he gave it to me, and I can't believe I gave you that truck. Well, really, you gave it to mom and dad. I don't know that I could really own much at sixteen. They ended up got getting tired of paying for gas for it, and <laughs> I think that's when they got me the Prelude. <laughs> <laughs> so hey that, that was a nice that truck was a nice truck yeah buddy. lifted up on 37s and what ended up happening to it they sold it and chad tried to buy it back from somebody on marketplace about a year ago <laughs> i saw that truck on marketplace. the very one the very yeah. one yeah it's it's beat all the crap now yeah. at least when i saw it that but. was the truck you picked me up at tractor supply in on our very first date yeah you had a ball sack hanging from the uh back yep. of it camouflage <laughs> Ball sack. That, yep. was a, that was a bad truck. We we bought that truck from a guy. He had that truck in a hay barn. Yeah. Um, and it was he did. He had it out in the hay barn yeah. and it, it was it didn't have a dent in it. I mean, it was just a straight original paint. Chad changed that real quick. <laughs> yeah. You had a camo ball sack from it. Yeah, it's it was swinging too. He had it on a chain where it could swing loose. You need a flesh color one, really. Well, <laughs> Camo kind of. When he picked of, me up on our first, must date. have been out of stock, Chili. Kind of like our store. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> <laughs> oh poor well, thing. No, I'll tell him that. Oh boy. <laughs> He can't hear it. I hear it. Oh, <laughs> oh y'all can hear it? Oh. Times. All right. Jeez. Okay. Anyway, well, all you people worried about that, It's I'm working on it. Y'all freaking. So what was the last car? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the 2006 Red Pontiac Point. Leather interior? Felt like a Cadillac. <laughs> now, what's the wheel. story behind that? I was just... I had to drive that for a few months. That was the first intro in, until it uh crapped the bed. But Jeff and them wanted to make sure, like what <laughs> they knew. Oh, this kid right here, it's buddy, car was worth about thirteen hundred bucks. Let's get him something cheap, Queenie, because <laughs> I don't know quite how he's going <laughs> to do on the road. Did they did they buy that car for you, or did was that? Oh yeah. So they bought that especially for you to drive, or was it? Did it belong to one of them? I got to look up. Oh a point. no, they didn't have that. That was Dang. for me. Dang, son. Did you pick it? Yeah. <laughs> you ought to have seen that, Jewel. What like happened a Cadillac, to it? Cadillac, man. It crapped the bed. What'd you do with it? Got rid of it. Just sold it? Yeah. To the junkyard. You should have held on to that, Jewel, man. We could be out there putting a new motor in that thing. We could have nah. made that a drag car, man. Nah. I just got a text from your dad, and it says, "Do you really believe anything Chili says?" Are you lying about, about your first what? car? No, lying about what? Oh, you got a you got a text from Chili's dad, Jeff. Jeff just texted me and said, "Do you really believe anything Chili says?" Okay, just now. Okay, Jeff. Should we call him? Let us in. I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's attached to the uh, to the Bluetooth, but you can hold it up to your microphone. Let's let's call Jeff and get the get the real lowdown if this was really Chili's first car or not. Let's get the. I mean, is that even a car? A Pontiac Point. I tried to look it up, and you can't Google it. Are so you calling him? I was Bull trying crap. to hook to no, the. No, just hold it up to your microphone. Put it on speakerphone. Oh crap! You can't friggin'. Jeff Google ain't going to disclose anything. He's not going to answer now because obviously. Yeah, he will. He'll answer. You got it on speakerphone? Yeah, chill. Can you hear it? Yeah, hold hold up. The, there you go. 
Jeff, you better answer this call. <laughs> what? Hey, we need you to. Hey. What's Chili lying about? I don't know. See? I just asked you if you believe everything he tells you. Why would you say that when we're in the middle of talking about his first car? I don't know. There ain't no <laughs> such thing as a Pontiac point. I Googled it. <laughs> Let's keep pulling up Pontiac Torrent. Are you lying? This is such a dumb thing to lie about. It was called a point. Jeff, give us a lowdown on this, man. Jeff, why are you not? What was Chili's first car? I, he should be able to tell you better than me. Jeff, this is your debut on the podcast. <laughs> You're not going to tell us anything, are you, Jeff? I know he's coming home later. Yeah, you, his, Chili must retaliate on Jeff and Queenie if they, <laughs> if they disclose any information about him. I bet he retaliates when he gets home. Oh, man. You're making a much bigger deal out of this. I drove a 06 Pontiac Point is the color of that safe right there. I just well, call that burgundy. Must have been one of one. They don't they can't pull up a point. You should have held on to that thing, Chill. Yeah. It was custom. <laughs> one, it was one of one. It was pretty much custom, but ain't uh, no doubt about that. Well, thanks for nothing, Jeff. All right. All right. Bye. <laughs> well, I hope I hope little Deborah don't hear that Jeff was doing that during business hours. <laughs> Oh, that's true. Yeah. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> He'll get knocked some of that sick time he's hoarding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me hit these super chats because it was going off the rails today. Dang. Thank you. Yeah. We got uh, Clint Rufton gave $50. Good grief. He Man. said, Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortune for money. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, and the temple will heal a mound overgrown. Thank you for that word, brother Clint. Thank you for that super chat, brother. Jax Teller gave ten dollars. Said Jax. being a father, coach, mentor. Every day, I try to affect someone in a positive way, and it's a goal of mine. Even if they treat me bad, I try to affect people with positive energy. And stay true to yourself. Do work, son. Yep. That's a big job, mm. Jax. <laughs> Coach, father, husband. You're getting it, son. Capertown VA said gave $37. Said the words you choose to use matter. Be deliberate. Don't sound like a coward. Thank you for calling us to a higher standard and allowing us to see our failures. It gives us a priceless opportunity to grow. Thank you so much. Phil Dog. $37. I like that. Phil Dog <laughs> gave 27 Who did? Phil Dog. $27.99 Canadian dollars. Phil Dog? Phil yeah. Dog. Yeah, Phil Dog 111 Phil, maybe one day Chile will sh ship you a shirt up there to <laughs> Commanda. Commanda. <laughs> he said, tech guy is increasing our wisdom yet again, and he shoots better than a Navy SEAL. <laughs> Truly, <laughs> a man amongst boys. <laughs> I love it, Phil Dog. Thank you, my brother. Tin Man, Justin Milford. Oh, Tin Man, what's up, brother? <laughs> yep, he gave fifty dollars. He said, Good grief. "So grateful for y'all. Feel blessed to be a part of the project. Y'all made me feel welcome, and most importantly, made me feel compelled to get better. See y'all at the proving ground." Roger that. See you there, Justin. See you there, brother. Thank you, man. And then we got another fifty dollar from Tava yeah. King. I don't know. They said thank you for responding to me, Team Zero Zero Four. GC, I found Jesus thanks to you. I don't know what team that what they would have been on. I don't know. Well, no team four. You never know because uh, that could be the basic course, the proving grounds. Yeah, that could be uh, the ROP course. Yeah, yeah. GC. There's been a bunch of team four. Is that Garrick? Could be. It may be. Could well, be. and we then Corn Pop gave a dollar ninety nine. Didn't say anything. Corn Pop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a yeah. bad dude. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> That's a bad dude. Dollar ninety nine, man. Yeah. Oh, Tava King said Rop. Okay, Team Roger Rop. that. Yeah. Roger that. That was the last Rop. Not this one that we just did, but the one before that. This so that one was we, really number two. This one that we just did was <laughs> Team Three, and the one before that was Team Four. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I think. Yeah, 
Yeah. Whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I think it went one, three, two, four, uh, one, one four, four, two, two three. three. Yeah. Yep. One, four, two, three. That's yeah. right. Mm. How Excellent. we count around here by ones. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's that hillbilly man. One, one, one. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right. guys, we appreciate those super chats, man. Yeah, uh, we definitely. Yeah, we don't. We don't expect yeah. that. And every yeah, time yeah. you guys do yeah, that, yeah. it. Uh, I don't know. It always just blows me away. Um, it makes a difference. I uh, want you guys to know we do appreciate you for listening. As much as we like to cut up, and as much as I like to rag on y'all and talk crap to y'all, uh, I'm always just blown away by you guys that tune in support three to seven project uh you guys that share the show share the episode with people um you contribute your hard-earned money through these super chats and through patreon and i never in my never in my wildest dreams could have imagined that i would be connected uh with a network of people like you guys who have been so dedicated to supporting us throughout the year. So I love you guys. Thank you so much until next time. I've said.